Each and every one of us relies on the ocean. This is a quote from Janice Searles Jones, CEO of Ocean Conservancy, an organization dedicated to fighting the greatest threats to our oceans today. I personally care a lot about our effect on the oceans, which is why I try to use reusable water bottles and try to minimize my plastic footprint. I've always had a general sense of how extensive the damage to our oceans is, but I just didn't know how incredible it was until I completed my research on this topic. Our oceans have been around since the beginning of time, are home to millions of diverse life and species, and they have a daily effect on our lives, whether we realize it or not. This is why it is imperative to preserve our ocean's health so that we can have a better life ourselves. I'd like to talk about why our oceans are so crucial to us uh, and to our planet, the effects that us have, that the human race have had upon the oceans, and what organizations are working on saving our oceans today. Let's begin with how our oceans are vital to our survival and well-being. According to the National Oceanic Atmospheric Association, a service that donates data and tools to coastal economies, anywhere from 50% to 80% of the entire world's oxygen comes from the oceans. This is due to the abundant plant life and a species called phytoplankton, which can actually photosynthesize and produce oxygen. Believe it or not, 50 to 80% is a higher percentage of oxygen than all of the rainforests in the entire world combined. We also get a large portion of our food from the ocean. Think of any seafood place that may have fresh caught seafood. According to our friend Dr. M. Dr. M. Sinjayan, a senior scientist and contributor at Conservation International, over 15% of the world's high quality protein comes from the oceans and is often the primary or only source of high quality protein for one billion people. We also use a lot of everyday products that have elements that come from the ocean, such as kelp, which can be found in shampoo and cake mix. Carrageenan, which is an additive derived from seaweed, can also be found in peanut butter, various cosmetics, and even toothpaste. Now that we have an idea of the importance that our oceans have on us and our daily lives, uh, let's talk about how we as a race have polluted and contaminated our oceans. The first way we've harmed our oceans is through incessant overfishing. Overfishing is defined by the American Heritage, American Heritage Dictionary of the English Language as to deplete a stock of fish by excessive fishing. We've seen a decline in various species, especially in sharks and rays um, due to overfishing. It is estimated that over 100 million sharks are caught and finned every year. Shark finning is unfortunately a brutal process where the shark is brought on board, all of its fins are cut off and it is thrown back into the ocean to sink to the ocean floor and suffocate because without its fins it cannot move and it cannot breathe. According to The Conversation, a source of analysis for researchers, 75% uh, of sharks and rays uh, are currently considered threatened and this percentage is even higher in the tropics and subtropics. Now, we may be thinking, well, if a shark goes extinct here or a shark goes extinct here, it may not even, you know, have any importance. But with one species dying, that puts the entire food web at risk, and then the entire oceanic ecosystem is overturned, leading to mass extinction. The second way is through ocean acidification, which is defined by the Dictionary of Physical Geography as a reduction in pH levels over an extended period of time due to an uptake in carbon dioxide levels. Well, what does this mean for sea life? Well, with an increase in carbon dioxide levels over the past 200 years, the ocean has become more acidic and there have been less carbonate ions, which is an important building block for species such as seashells, uh, clams, oysters, and even coral reefs. Without these carbonate ions, these building blocks, they have a much harder time building and producing a skeleton and staying alive. The final and most impactful way we have harmed our oceans is by dumping our waste into them. Uh, it is estimated that 8 million metric tons of plastic waste is dumped into the oceans every single year, according to Britta Hardesty, a senior research scientist at the World Economic Forum. According to the same World Economic Forum, by 2050, there will be more plastic than fish in the ocean in terms of weight. Well, why is this relevant to us? Besides the fact that it's just irresponsible for us to dump our plastic into the oceans, it can also kill a lot of sea life. The most common example is plastic getting caught on sea turtles, or when they eat it, it can puncture their gut, clog their intestine, or even if they eat enough of the plastic, it will clog up to the gut to where they cannot digest it and they will actually starve to death. It can also get caught around the neck of various birds or get caught in the fins of other fish, which can harm them and then lead to death. Well, unfortunately, this tragedy continues. There is hope for the future. There are multiple organizations working on combating these changes today, such as Team Seas, Ocean Conservancy, and the one that I support, the Ocean Cleanup. The Ocean Cleanup is a nonprofit organization working on not only stemming the flow of plastic into the oceans by stopping it in the rivers, but also cleaning up existing trash in the oceans that is already there. 
It was founded in 2013 by 18 year old Boyan Slats, and since then it has gathered a team of over 210 researchers and scientists, two different types of robots that are working autonomously to clean up trash, and they are working towards a 90% plastic reduction waste, plastic waste reduction uh, by 2040. Now that you know how the ocean affects us daily, I encourage you all to donate any amount, however big or small, to help fight these terrible shifts in our oceans today. If we don't act and help, if we don't act and help stop these awful changes, it won't just be a faraway dilemma that never affects us and we only hear about it on the news. It will come to our doorsteps and affect us personally in our day-to-day -day life, uh, which is why we need to work together to fight these problems. Finally, let's cover what I've talked about so far. Oceans are of paramount importance to our planet and to our species, which is why it is essential that we reverse these heartbreaking changes that have been wrought upon our oceans by our own species. Uh, it is imperative that we work towards the future, which is why I consider, which is why I ask you to consider donating to the ocean cleanup to help them in their mission. Think about all this uh, that I've shared with you the next time you use a one-use plastic water bottle or throw away a recyclable item, because as stated before, each and every one of us relies on the ocean. Thank you. Do you remember listening to music in an olive garden when you're hanging out with your family or friends? Or even the music when you're on hold with a big bank or organization? Or even the music that you hear in an elevator as you're going up those many stories? Well, that mix of groovy rhythms and complicated riffs is what's known as jazz music. And while I'm sure you've heard of it, and while you also probably think it's complex, it's an art form just like all other forms of music. Now, jazz is something very common in our lives. It's something that is present in high schools and on street corners in those three examples I gave you before. Uh, and it brings people together through its conversational style. Now, jazz is also important to you because it's music too, just like hip hop and rap that's gone underappreciated for some time. And while hip hop and rap have gone to the mainstream, uh, jazz hasn't. Now, why is that? We'll get into a little bit later. But what's more important about that is that, that all three of those have one thing in common. They all appeal to improvement and conversation, and they all have unique African-American roots. So why shouldn't jazz be in the spotlight? Well, we need a hero, somebody that's going to help us bring jazz to the spotlight. Who's that hero, you say? Jazz and Lincoln Center. They're stationed in Lincoln Center in New York City, and their main mission is to promote the diversity of jazz culture. So hopefully by the end of the speech, I will convince you to help them out. But before that, we have to explore, explain what jazz culture is, show why it matters, and then also show how our hero is helping the cause. Now, what's jazz culture first off? Well, it's jazz history. It's where did it come from? Jazz came from slave songs, African-American church songs, European classical forms from the French, Mississippi blues, and American military marches. More specifically, though, it started in New Orleans, Louisiana, with the first jazz instrumentalist being Buddy Bolden, who went on to influence greats like Louis Armstrong, who I'm sure you've heard of. Now, more on the history from Irina Pavlovic and her work, Preservation of the Jazz Culture, Its Roots and Traditions, which you can find on EBSCOhost under Academic Search Ultimate. She says, the Afro-American music that we call jazz today has developed from folk and dance music of Afro-Americans under influences of diverse cultures and multicultural society. Now, what that means is basically jazz is, uh, is super diverse. Now, why does this matter? Well, because jazz, just like America, is a melting pot, and on top of that, promotes creativity as a form of democracy. Now, how is it a melting pot? Well, it's a melting pot because if you put together all the stuff I was talking about before, the slave roots, African-American church songs, European classical forms, mix it together in a pot, boom, you get jazz music. Do the same thing over here with America. You get English influences, French influences, German influences, all those influences, mix them together in a pot, boom, it's America. So they're both synonymous as melting pots. Not only that, but jazz culture is also a smaller melting pot and the big American melting pot. And if we value America so much as a melting pot, why shouldn't we value jazz? Now, to help you understand how it promotes creativity as a form of democracy, let me tell you my perspective on it. In my two and a half years of playing jazz trumpet in my high school, I found that I was mostly studying improv, which is when you make a solo up on the fly. And what I found was it really improved me and my classmates' creativity far beyond that of other arts. And on top of that, the call and response, the ebb and flow of the song became this harmonious, democratic conversation. It was a great celebration of music and diversity. It became, and that's what jazz is. It's a celebration. It's a harmonious, democratic conversation. And it's a lot like the extemporaneous style of speaking that I'm presenting you today. But now that we understand what jazz culture is and why it matters, let's explore how Jazz and Lincoln Center, our hero, is helping the cause. Well, their mission statement, which you can find on www.jazz.org, is to entertain, enrich, and expand a global community for jazz through performance, education, and advocacy. 
We're going to focus mainly on the education and advocating, but you'll see a little bit of hints of performance in there. Now my first example is the Essentially Ellington High School Jazz Band Festival, in which top jazz high schools across the U.S. will perform, work, and compete with the best jazz musicians across the world. Now more on it from their website you can find is that one of the schools here in local Champaign, Champaign Central High School, actually participated in the 2021 virtual festival. Not only that, but one of their students is now currently at Parkland. And you want to know what that means? That means that jazz culture has gone all the way through the high school, all the way up the ladder to college. It's everywhere, universal by place. Now, if you're not already convinced, let me give you a few more examples. My next two examples are from Jonathan R. Wells in his internship report for his master's degree in arts administration. Now, he says that from toddlers learning percussion through Weebop, an interactive educational program designed for children from ages eight months to five years old, to lectures through Swing University, an adult educational program that teaches individuals how to be effective listeners, Jazz and Lincoln Center has developed educational programs for every generation of individuals interested in learning more about jazz. Now, what does that mean? Well, to summarize Wells, what he's saying is basically, if you're a 15-year-old girl, an eight-month-old baby, a 60-year-old man, or a 100-year-old man, you can enjoy jazz regardless of your age. It's universal across age groups, except for maybe seven months old, but They'll get there as they'll grow up. Now, now that we know how Jazz and Lincoln Center is helping the cause, how can you be a hero in your own community? Well, let me tell you. You can contribute in two major ways, donations, social media. You can donate to the Jazz and Lincoln Center annual gala on their website, www.jazz.org, with just a dollar today, the equivalent of a large Coke at McDonald's to, in their words, help make possible the thousands of unique performances educational programs and resources produced annually by Jazz and Lincoln Center, which reach more than two million people across the world. That's a lot of people, right? Well, if all 20 of the people in my Common 03 class were to do this, that'd be $20 raised. They didn't convince one more person, 40. Get to a million people, it just grows exponentially to a million dollars. All it takes is but a small spark. Now, if you don't have money, that's okay. Just take two minutes out of your day to follow, like, comment, share, subscribe. You're all familiar with it on their content on social media. They're active on Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter. Just search their name in the search bar, Jazz and Lincoln Center. Now, today, now that we know how to help our hero, today we've defined jazz culture. We've explained why it matters as a piece of American culture. We've explored how Jazz and Lincoln Center has promoted jazz culture through its main programs and mission statement. We've also labeled how you can help the cause and be a hero in your own community. So I hope this shows you why jazz is so important to America and how you could possibly help two million people globally just through your aid. I also want to remind you, jazz is music, jazz is American, jazz is American music, and it brings forth an excellent representation of diversity through its unique African-American roots and its appeals to improvement and conversation. So please, for diversity, improvement, and conversation's sake, go out and donate just a dollar today, or spend two minutes out of your day just to promote them on social media and any of those forms I listed before. Will you be our hero? Thank you. Two thousand five hundred and counting human lives have been saved, in other words, exonerated since 1989. One of those lives could have been someone you know. I have done a case study on Anthony Ray Hinton, a man who was wrongfully convicted, then exonerated, as well as used credible sources from Equal Justice Initiative, the Innocence Project, the National Registry of Exoneration, and Michigan Law. Because there are many people falsely accused or convicted, anyone with the means should donate to Equal Justice Initiative, also known as EJI. EJI is a nonprofit organization that provides legal representation to people illegally convicted, unfairly sentenced, abused in state jails and prisons. They challenge the death penalty, excessive punishment, and provide re-entry assistance to formerly incarcerated people. Today I will talk about why wrongful convictions occur, why wrongful conviction presents an issue, as well as why we should support EJI. First, let's talk about factors that cause wrongful conviction. So why does wrongful conviction occur? Wrongful conviction occurs for multiple reasons. The highest contributing factor can be traced back to perjury or false accusations, which occurred in 56% of 1,927 exonerees in 2016, according to the National Registry of Exoneration. 
Official misconduct was at a record high in 2018 with 107 exonerees, according to the National Registry of Misconduct, and was evident in 51% of the 1,927. Another high percentage of wrongful conviction is attributed to mistaken witness identification, which occurred in 30% of the 1,927, following false or misleading forensic evidence at 24%, false confessions resulted in 12%, as well as inadequate counsel, which can cause wrongful convictions as well. And following into that is official indifference. So you guys are probably wondering what is official indifference? Official indifference is when police, prosecutors, and judges are not held accountable for misconduct that leads to wrongful convictions such as fabricating evidence, presenting false testimony, or refusing to consider proof of innocence. Immunity laws protect them from liability in cases and even in cases of gross misconduct. Prosecutors cannot be held liable for falsifying evidence, coercing witnesses, or withholding evidence, as well as introducing illegally seized evidence at trial, states Equal Justice Initiative. So now that we have talked about factors that cause wrongful conviction, let's turn our attention to why it is an issue. Minorities are rep overrepresented in wrongful convictions, which leads to further prejudice. African Americans make up 47% of exonerations, even though they only account for 13% of the population. Innocent black people are seven times more likely to be convicted of murder than, innocent, than an innocent white person. Black people that are convicted of murder are 50% more likely to be innocent than a non-black person convicted of murder. Not only is race an issue in wrongful conviction, but it leaves the real perpetrator free to commit more crimes, creates a new victim, which then drains resources for victim services, according to Northwestern University. So now that we hopefully understand that there is an issue in wrongful conviction, let's talk about donating to help fight wrongful convictions. So why should we donate? We should donate to EJI because they help save innocent lives. EJI repeals illegal convictions like a trial they won for Marsha Colby, a mother of six illegally sentenced to life without parole. Her sentence was based on past drug addiction and poverty rather than substantial evidence. EJI also, well EJI's attorneys also introduced forensic evidence by three of the nation's top firearm examinators that concluded the revolver owned by Anthony Ray Hinton's mother did not match the crime evidence found that convicted him to life awaiting the death sentence. One of the longest serving death row prisoners, Anthony was arrested in 1985 and was released in 2015. He was wrongfully imprisoned for 30 years. After being exonerated, his new motto is the sun does shine. As EJI themselves states, your contribution is critical to our efforts to end mass incarceration and, and challenge the racial and economic injustice, as well as protect the basic human rights of the most vulnerable people in American society. If you do not wish to donate, you can still retweet, share, and regram EJI's post, as well as visit the Legacy Museum in Montgomery, Alabama. Or you can purchase from their shop, which includes items like apparel, books, calendars, and accessories. In conclusion, today I have spoken about why wrongful convictions occur, why wrongful conviction is an issue, and who we should donate and support to if we want to help end injustices in America. Because there are thousands of lives at, stakes, at stake, I hope you are now determined to help save a life, a life that may be yours one day. Thank you. Terry Daniels was a hardworking mother of two who after serving her country during the first Gulf War, found herself unable to make ends meet. 
No matter how much she struggled or scrimped to get by, her paychecks only barely covered her housing costs, leaving nothing left to put toward groceries for her and her children. Terry's is just one of several real-life stories shared on the Eastern Illinois Food Bank's website of people affected by food insecurity, not knowing where their next meal would come from. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, in 2020, there were 38.3 million people living in food insecure households. For many, the recent pandemic has only made the situation worse. I know that this may seem like a daunting reality, but with the help of people like you, it doesn't have to be hopeless. Right here in East Central Illinois, the Eastern Illinois Food Bank is striving to end hunger by providing food resources to the economically disadvantaged. By offering your support, you have the opportunity to become an actively engaged member of your community and make a positive impact in the lives of individuals and families in need. Over the next few minutes, I'll briefly be giving you a little bit of the organization's history, as well as telling you some of the ways that they are meeting the need for food regionally. Lastly, I'll suggest some ways that you too can get involved in the fight against hunger. So just in case you're not too familiar with the Eastern Illinois Food Bank, let me start off by telling you a little bit about who they are and how they got started. The food bank has been operating for nearly 40 years now. According to, the, to their website, EIF began as part of a major regional effort to develop an emergency food network in central Illinois. They first opened their doors in 1983, and that first year they received very little support from the local community, only managing to distribute about 30,000 pounds of food. All that changed, however, in 1987, when the Junior League of Champaign-Urbana organized the first Food for Families drive, and that effort helped EIF raise about 84,000 pounds of food. From then on, they have continued to gain momentum. As stated on their website, today EIF distributes more than 10 million pounds annually on a budget of just over $3 million. Food from the Eastern Illinois Food Bank's warehouse reaches 120,000 people visiting 167 agencies and programs each year. So now that you're a little bit more familiar with who EIF is, let me go into a little bit more detail about what exactly it is that they do. One of EIF's main functions is supplying food to those in need through a network of partner agencies. So they obtain food resources primarily through purchase or donations from a variety of food distributors, manufacturers, and retailers, such as Aldi, County Market, Meyer Ruler Foods, Sam's Club, Target, Walmart, and others. They then distribute these resources to a network of food pantries, homeless shelters, soup kitchens, and other similar agencies. In addition, they also have outreach programs specifically aimed towards helping children, seniors, and veterans. The school market program, for example, offers food assistance to underprivileged children and families through public schools. Mobile food pantries deliver food to rural communities that have limited access to food resources. And the Food Bank's Food as Medicine program collaborates with Promise Healthcare to offer nutritious food to patients at a variety of healthcare facilities. Programs like these have provided relief to thousands throughout central Illinois. People like James, a retired grandfather who was struggling to provide for himself, his daughter, and her five children who had come to live with them after falling on hard times. Or Clarence, a 96-year-old World War II veteran who was trying to stretch his $900 a month in benefits as far as they would go. So as you can see, the food bank has been working tirelessly to alleviate hunger throughout our communities. But despite their success, the need for food throughout Eastern Central Illinois remains ongoing. So what can you do to help? There are three ways that you can support the mission of EIF. These are financial contributions, food donations, and volunteering your time. As with many nonprofit organizations, EIF relies on the generosity of their financial donors in order to operate and meet the need for food regionally. You can make donations on the website by clicking the Donate Money link under the Take Action tab. And you, you can set up a one-time payment or it can be monthly recurring. And please remember that your gift of any dollar amount makes a difference. But how do you know that your money is going where you intend for it to? Well, CharityNavigator.org scores EIF at 95.87 out of 100, earning it an exceptional four-star rating. 
This score is determined by evaluating a variety of financial performance metrics, as well as accountability and transparency factors. According to their program expense ratio, 95.5% of the food bank's finances goes directly towards its programs and services. 3% go to fundraising efforts, and 1.5% cover its uh, administrative expenses. So to put this in simple terms, that means that about 96 cents of every dollar that you give goes directly toward providing food resources to the hungry. But your donations don't need to be monetary. You can donate food or other items such as canned goods, boxed meals, or other grocery items. And they also welcome donations of toiletries, cleaning supplies, pet food, and fresh homegrown produce. The last way that you can give is of your time. There are a number of volunteer opportunities available at EIF. For example, they just recently acquired a new warehouse and they are currently looking for people to help with the transition process. And they are always looking for people to help out with food mobiles like the one scheduled to deliver in Danville this weekend on April 30th. In addition to those opportunities, you can volunteer regularly at any of the 170 pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, and other emergency food providers that are a part of their network of partner agencies. You can register for any of these opportunities online at eifoodbank.org. Hunger is not a problem isolated to some remote corner of the world. It is an affliction far too common and close to home. That's why organizations like EIF exist. Earlier, you'll remember that I told you about Terry Daniels, a hardworking mother struggling to overcome her circumstances when she first visited one of EIF's food pantries. Today, Terry Daniels is working at the University of Illinois. She's earned her master's degree, and she also serves on the board of directors at the food bank. This may not have been possible without the generosity, compassion, and willingness of people to help who support the mission of EIF. So I sincerely encourage you too to please get involved. By giving of your time, resources, or money, you become part of something greater than yourself, and you offer hope for another day to those who might not find it elsewhere. Thank you.